Hi, I'm Tyler Norton, founder here at ASEA, and it's my absolute privilege today to spend a little time talking to you about something that's very near and dear to my heart and very important to us here at ASEA, and that is what we refer to as the ASEA ethos. Let me take a minute and just help you understand what we mean when we say ethos. Cultures are important. Culture can be defined as the beliefs, the behaviors, even the characteristics of a particular group of people that are then transmitted from one generation to another. And we all know this from looking at cultures across the world. They have unique be beliefs, unique behaviors and characteristics. And they transfer those through families or other elements of their culture. Here at ASEA, we believe that we have a corporate culture that we're responsible to build. That there's beliefs and characteristics and behaviors that matter to us. And central to that is the notion of an ethos. Now, let me describe an ethos. If a culture is all of the beliefs and the behaviors and characteristics, then an ethos is actually kind of the core center. It becomes the distinguishing characteristics, the distinguishing values that are fundamental to a culture. In the Polynesian culture, an ethos might be described with one single word. In Hawaii, they would use the word aloha. Aloha, we think, means hello or goodbye when you get to Hawaii and they put a lei around your neck, but the truth is it actually means love. And so each culture has its own ethos. In America, the culture's been the ethos of the American dream, which is that if you work hard, honest effort is rewarded, and that you can actually achieve things for you and your family. Here at ASEA, from the very beginning, we've made culture something that's strategically very important for us. We wanted to be clear and deliberate and declarative about what the beliefs and behaviors and characteristics were that we want to embody our culture. And we've taken time over the last years, several years, where we've shared presentations with people about what that looks like. What is the ethos of ASEA? And it's my privilege to share a little bit about each one of those throughout a series of videos and presentations with all of you. What is the ASEA ethos? What is the differentiating and distinguishing spirit of this broad culture? I'm excited to share it with you. Most of you know that I'm a lover of words and where they come from. Uh, that's called etymology, the study of the derivative of words. And one of the words that's interesting to me is the word corporation. It, corporation comes from the etymological derivative of corporeal. In fact, uh, in Spanish, the word cuerpo is body. And corporeal means body. It means a corporation, in fact, is a body. It's interesting also to note that an organization comes from the same derivative word as organs. So I like to think of a corporation as a vital kind of organization of organs, a body, a physical body. And if a corporation can have a body and can be a body, and literally the word corporation comes from the notion of a body, here's a question. Can a corporation have a soul? Is there such thing as a corporate soul? Well, if soul is defined as the spiritual part, of a person that is believed to give life to the body, then I might argue that a corporate soul is the spiritual part of an organization or a corporation that is believed to give life to the entire company. Now for me, that corporate soul is embodied in the definition and notion of what we referred to earlier as an ethos. Ethos for me is the corporate soul. It's the distinguishing spirit or character of an organization. It's the fundamental values and beliefs that they hold dear and while they're not perfect, they're trying really hard to live by those ideals. And when they do, not just me or Chuck Funky, our CEO, or any of our senior executives, but the whole field force, when they're genuinely trying to live by these fundamental values, it actually starts to embody a spirit. And that spirit, married with the corporation or the body, becomes the soul. Together, those things unite and, I believe, create a very unique environment where people can come and succeed. So I want you to give some thought to the notion of a corporate soul. Is it possible? If it's a corporation as a body, can it have a soul? And in my opinion, it can. And what I'm about to share with you through a series of small presentations are small elements, little pieces of the corporate soul at ASEA, what we refer to affectionately and collectively as the ASEA ethos. The very first principle of the ASEA ethos is embodied in a formula that we call EPC. 
And the EPC formula has been something we've been teaching really since almost the very first meeting we ever hosted in a field environment. Let me describe it quickly to you. EPC is a formula that compares the relationship with our motivation and commitment to ego and economics, our commitment to principles, and compares that with our commitment and motivation to build capacity, which is the C part. And in order to measure this formula, we put it into a graph measuring on the y-axis from zero to nine, your motivation and your commitment. And on the x-axis, we take a look at each of these dimensions, ego and economic, principles and capacity. What happens if someone's ego and economic motivations, that is their desire to gratify themselves, to be recognized and to make money, is a five on a scale from zero to nine, good or bad? In my model, in this formula, I don't know. It, to me, it's too early to tell. What we do need to understand first is what's their motivation and commitment on a scale from zero to nine to principles. Now, what are principles? Principles are concentrated truths that can be applied to a wide variety of circumstances. Principles are honesty, humility, civility, hard work, uh, ethics, integrity. All of these words are concentrated truths that apply at home, at the office, in the community, in your country, wherever you are. And if I find that someone's commitment and motivation, as measured on the y-axis of our graph, is an eight to principles or truths compared to a five in ego and economics, to me that's a healthy ratio. And I call that the EP ratio. That is, how motivated are you, or committed to you, are you to ego and economic things and outcomes, as opposed to saying, I want to live in alignment with true principles and be successful that way. Now that EP ratio is also something I refer to as motive management. And from the very beginning, we felt like this industry was probably a little E over P as a broad profile. I think you would all agree that the industry as a whole tends to signal country club memberships and mansions and Ferraris and Maseratis and all these different things you can have if you just sign up now and join this little business. Well, the fact of the matter is that's a violation of principle because that's not how it works. And it's also a signal indicator that you're looking at an organization that's promoting E in many ways over P. And when we started this, we thought if strategy is what makes you different, let's be different. Let's talk about principles, truths that prevail and that can be applied in a wide variety of settings while still promoting a healthy ego and economic. We still recognize our people. We want them to be recognized. We want them to make money. We just don't want that to be the only thing we do and talk about and ignore the notion of promoting prevailing principles. Now let's talk about capacity as the last piece. If you're measuring motivation and commitment on the y-axis from zero to nine, and the third dimension we're measuring in this little model is capacity, Capacity means actual or potential ability. It's referring to the notion that each of us have a certain amount of capacity and can grow that. If I have a bottle of water that's a 16 ounce capacity, but only has two ounces in it at this time, the capacity still is 16, despite the fact that it only has two ounces. So people are the same. We have an unlimited amount of capacity or potential, and maybe some of our actual ability at this time is a little bit lower. This EPC formula says that similar to principles, we should have a high score of motivation and commitment to building our capacity, making ourselves better over time. In fact, the target score for me has always been a five, eight, and eight. That is a five in motivation and commitment to ego and economics. I wanna make a good living. I wanna be recognized for my efforts and do good things and achieve good things. But my commitment to principles is an eight. And having an eight says, I'm more committed to living in alignment with principles than I am necessarily just to making money. The last number for me is an eight on capacity, so the target score is a 588. And what that means to me is I wanna do better, I wanna be better, I wanna grow and develop my own abilities and constantly be striving and reaching for more. Now a quick word on why it's not nine scores, the highest principle and the highest capacity score. Well, I think you'd all agree, we can all learn more, we can always get better. We can always learn new principles and apply them more effectively in our lives. And the delta between eight and nine on both principles and capacity for me says, hey, never suggest to yourself that you're already a nine. There's always room to continue to grow. Now this little formula for years I've had in a maxim or a saying that kind of carried the day for me, which was keep E under P, manage E under P, and drive up C. So the maxim I would share with you today is keep E under P, keep ego and economic motivations under your commitment to principles and drive up your capacity. And if you do that, I can assure you, you'll have enduring success. It may take a little longer to get there, but it'll endure and sustain. There are lots of people that turn away 
from this model and have short-term success by promoting their ego and economic motivations. But over time, principles catch up and typically those aren't the people that have enduring success. Okay, so in summary, let me just take a minute and summarize EPC. What does EPC really mean? Well, EPC means manage your motives. Never let your ego or economic motivations trump your commitment to living in alignment with true principles. And the second part of EPC can be summarized as build your capacity. Remember my dad saying that you're valued in life in large measure to the degree that you make yourself valuable. So work on yourself, always get better. Have you ever wondered why some people seem to be just having a better life experience? They seem more focused, they seem more happy, they seem more engaged, and others may be less so. Several years ago, I learned a simple principle taught by a gentleman who set out to answer that question. Why is it that some people are having a better experience than others? He's actually a University of Chicago psychologist by the name of Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, originally from Central Europe. And Several decades ago, actually more than three decades ago, he wanted to know what is it that makes some people happier or more engaged and focused. Now he didn't want to approach this from the perspective of metaphysics or religion or anything else. He, he wanted to get scientific about it. And so he gave pagers to people and began paging them throughout the day and he would ask them to respond to a series of questions. And they would have to respond with a number, one to ten. The questions he would ask are, at this very moment, how engaged are you? or how focused are you? How much skill is what you're doing right now requiring? And again, they would answer on a scale from one to 10. Now there were several questions that he asked and these questions and the numbers that they responded with started to create a profile. And he could map and plot that profile on a, on a little, gra little graph. And he started to see some commonalities. He saw that the people that were focused and happy and engaged seemed to be challenging themselves and using their skill sets. And he actually plotted this on a graph where on the y-axis he was measuring how challenged someone was and on the x-axis how much skill did it require for them to do this. And where the challenge actually was equal to the skill at a certain level, it actually indicated this channel that he called the flow channel. Now why did he call it flow? He would interview people and ask them, what is it about this activity that you're doing that makes you excited or engaged? And what he found out is they oftentimes said, I just feel like in this moment I was in flow, time distorted. There was value in what I was doing, in, in, inherent to what I was doing. I wasn't doing it for a paycheck. I was doing it because I loved it. A lot of these people were artists or athletes, and many of them were business people, but they were doing what they did out of a love, and they were challenging themselves and using their skills to their fullest. And Dr. Csikszentmihalyi named this the flow channel. And what he learned was that people are most engaged and self-actualization is most likely to occur when there's a certain amount of challenge in life married with a certain amount of skill. And if the challenge in your world dropped but your skill level stayed the same, you might find yourself in a different situation, an actual situation where you're in control. A little bit less in this flow channel but in control. You're still happy, you're confident. But if you really wanted to get back to this place of flow where time distorts and you're doing things that you know you can accomplish, you would have to introduce a new challenge. And lifting that challenge up would then push you back into the flow channel. Similarly, if in this particular case you had a high degree of challenge but a lower level of skill, in this particular case it might take you out of the flow channel and put you into what he referred to as arousal, an awakening. This challenge is a little more than I'm capable of doing. And that has to be met with what? An increase in skill sets that push me back into this flow channel. Now he mapped the whole human experience beyond just flow and control and arousal but said if the challenge is even lower but the skill set stays the high then it's relaxation. You might be in a position where you're saying I can do this, I have the skills to do this but I'm not pushing myself up. Again in order to get back into flow you might have to take a significant lift in your challenge. From there, even if the skill level dropped more and the challenge was low, it's boredom. At a very low skill and challenge level would be apathy or even depression. Where the challenge climbs and the skill level is low, you might be worried or stressed or sad. And then ultimately, if you have a really high challenge with very low skill set, that can trigger a sense or a feeling of anxiety. Now, the reason this mattered and the reason we wanted to teach this as part of the ASEA ethos is actually fairly simple. What it teaches us is that each individual that wants to be happy, engaged, and excited 
needs to remember that these conditions of happiness and, and optimal experience don't happen on their own. And they certainly don't happen just sitting around. Look at my dad, retired I don't know how many times. Why? Because he wasn't in flow if he was just playing golf every day. Being in flow means you're challenging yourself, you're pushing yourself, and you're finding happiness and then the optimal experience is, is when you're pushing your challenge levels up and you're developing yourself into new skills. Let's summarize this second principle of the ASEA ethos, what we refer to as flow. Flow reminds us that happiness and self-actualization are most likely to occur when you're challenging yourself and when you're developing your skill set. Pushing yourself into that flow channel means constantly pushing the frontiers of challenging, challenges, and skills in all areas of life. At the very first bronze base camps that we offered here at ASEA, we sat in a room and asked ourselves, how do we continue to teach meaningful principles that could fill in this ASEA ethos? And for many years, I've been a big believer in a concept taught by a group called the Arbinger Institute, who originally wrote a book called Leadership and Self-Deception and followed it up with another book called The Anatomy of Peace. And we made a decision that a core part of what we wanted to teach is tied to the principles found in The Anatomy of Peace. Let me take just a minute and talk to you about what that means and why it's a part for us of the ASEA ethos. The fundamental principle in the anatomy of peace is that at any given moment, we have a heart either at war or a heart at peace towards others around us. And that heart at war or peace is a function of a choice point, a moment in time when we have actually decided to be responsive to the needs of others around us or to be resistant to that. If I'm responsive to the needs of someone around me, then my heart's at peace about them. If I'm resistant to their needs, then my heart's at war. Another way to think about this is when I see other people as objects, typically in that moment when I've resisted their need, their human needs that they're signaling they need help with, in that moment I'm resisting their humanity. I'm seeing them and treating them as an object. On the other side, when I see a person as a person, and I can sense their needs and what they need from me to, to be happy or to be helped, in that moment I'm being responsive and I'm seeing that person as a person. Now how does this work? Well, we have this happen every day. Every one of us has opportunities to see people around us and sense and feel that they may need some help. Probably some of the more significant examples would be you're driving down the road and you see someone trying to fix their vehicle. Now I'm not saying you have to stop for every person. But you do have to say to yourself, what would it feel like if I was that person and in need of some help? Uh, for me, this happens often in an airport where I might be rushing to get to a plane and trying to get through security, and there might be a mom in front of me with three little kids taking their time getting through. Well, I can choose to see that mother as a person, or I can choose to see her as an object. What is the self-dialogue? Well, I might say she could probably use some help with her bags while she gets the kids through security. I should offer to help. That would be a, a responsive sense or a feeling. But if I'd resist that urge or that impulse and say, she doesn't need my help and she shouldn't be here on a Monday morning when everyone's trying to get to their business flights and get on the road, and who would bring three little kids on their own without someone to help anyway? Those are all classic resistant justifying mindsets that are treating her like an object. What if I saw her as a person? What if I knew that she was going to a funeral for a family member and didn't have the help and she was taking the kids with her. Would my heart soften towards that person seeing her that way? And if I did, wouldn't I feel more responsive and at peace about giving her a hand? See, the anatomy of peace teaches us that we live these moments all the time, all around us. We're constantly interfacing with other people and as people, we know what it feels like to be people. As such, we know when someone's in need. We know when a mom taking kids through security at the airport needs a hand. Feeling that impulse is, makes us human, but responding to it makes us more effective and influential. In fact, the degree of influence we have on others has much more to do with the condition of our hearts towards them than to what we say or do. One of the core principles taught in this book is that people respond primarily to how we feel about them, not what we say or do. I think we've all walked out the door of our homes telling our spouse or other significant loved one, hey, I love you, but may not have meant it and felt it in our hearts. And what this book and philosophy pulls out is that how we see other people, whether as people themselves or objects, in fact determines the degree of influence we have. Now think about it. 
What if we could create a culture, an ethos, where the fundamental values we're teaching and promoting are to see other people as people? In an industry where, by and large, we're taught that they're numbers or they're objects. If you add all these little people to your, your system or to your business, you're going to make X in money. But what if we saw them as people? What if we treated them as people? Our whole approach to them would be very different. And from the very first Bronze Base Camp all the way to today, we've taught this. Some of our senior executives here at the company have even been certified in being able to teach, coach, and train these principles. I highly encourage you to take some time and read The Anatomy of Peace as part of the ASEA ethos. The Anatomy of Peace teaches us to see and treat others as people, not as objects. And it suggests that your influence increases when you recognize and respond to the humanity of others. When you see others truly, you are true. It also teaches how to address conflict resolution. When a conflict arises, and it always does, ask yourself one simple question. How am I contributing to this problem? How am I part of the problem? Asking that question sincerely is an absolute invitation to the others with whom you have a conflict to do the same. And if two people are asking, how am I part of the problem? It will accelerate resolution and keep hearts at peace. Another core tenet of the ASEA ethos is a simple phrase that we've used for many years. We've also called it 3B or B3, and it stands for believe, belong, and become. Now, I'm keenly aware that companies have statements on their walls, they have value statements, and they all have these trite little things that they say as pleasantries. But this phrase of believe, belong, become is at the very heart of the ASEA ethos. And let me explain why. It's been my experience that very few people do anything without first believing. The notion of having a conviction or a belief to start something is at the very heart of this notion of believe, belong, and become. Think about it. You wouldn't get up in the morning and get ready for work if you didn't believe you would get there. You wouldn't do really anything. You wouldn't go to work and actually put in two weeks if you didn't believe that you would get remunerated for it. Believing precedes all meaningful action. And so when we say that the first part of our ethos is belief, it, we really mean that you have to have a conviction. Now, a conviction of what? First, believe in yourself. I am absolutely convinced that the most underutilized and underperforming resource in the world is the human resource. It's you. It's not oil. It's not gas. It's not wood. It's not all these other natural resources. It's people. It's the human resource. And why? Because somewhere early in your childhood, some teacher that might have had a bad day or a bad burrito for lunch decides to tell you that you're not good at something or you got a poor grade or heaven forbid even a family member might have signaled to you that you shouldn't believe in yourself but somewhere along the way we get conditioned to believing that we can't instead of absolutely having a conviction that we can the first part of believe belong become is believing in yourself and I would tell you, if you come to ASEA and want to participate in this ethos, leave the trash behind of what you think you are or are not, and come here with a knowledge and belief that you can do anything, because that is, in fact, the truth. In addition to believing in yourself, you also need to gain a strong conviction of our products, both the Redox Supplement as well as Renew 28, our revitalizing skin gel. Having a conviction in these products will send a far greater signal to the people that you talk to than trying to logically convince them about science or chemistry or anything else. I've always said that conviction sells and emotions buy. Logic pays for auto ship down the road. And if you try to flip that and use logic early on as the reason why someone does that, you typically tend to go outside of the fairway of what you should be saying. What you need to do is gain a conviction about these products. How do you gain that conviction? Share the product, use the products, and actually internalize the fact that they're making a difference in the lives of others and in your own life. And when you gain that conviction, all you have to do is campaign from a point of belief. You don't have to convince people. You don't have to change people's eye color. You simply have to say what you believe. And so you can see that believing in yourself as a starting point married with a belief in these products becomes a powerful combination. Now, what else do you need to believe in? You need to believe in this opportunity as well as this company. This is not a game and this is not a get rich scheme. This is a real business opportunity where if you put honest sweat, intelligent effort into it, 
you will get a reward. There are people inside this organization that have taught me that this industry is as significant economically as any other profession you might find in any industry. You can make great money in this business and you need to believe that. You need to have a belief that this industry and this opportunity are as professional as any other. And when you marry belief in yourself with belief in these core products and then a belief in the opportunity, the company and the industry, you are set for the next stage of this 3B model, which is believing then becomes belonging. We know that belonging is one of the core fundamental needs we have as human beings. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs suggests that beyond the fundamental need we have for food and shelter, we have a desire and a need to belong to others and to belong to something. My belief is belonging means owning. In fact, to belong a stock means you own the stock. To belong to an organization means we own you and you own us and that we care for each other. If two people believe, not only in themselves and the products and the opportunity, but also in each other, don't they belong to each other? And in that moment that they belong to each other, something very special happens. They start to take interest in one another's success. They actually start to pay attention to the other person and what they're doing. Now when that happens, we've moved to the third dimension of this 3B model, which is becoming. If you believe and you have someone to whom you belong, the most natural outshoot of that then becomes a becoming. People start to develop. They start to grow. They feel like they're in an environment where they're being led by cheerleaders who want them to win because they belong to each other. And we have common beliefs, not only just beliefs around products or opportunities, but also the very ASEA ethos I'm talking about. Our core fundamental values are the same. We have common beliefs there. We have a belief in our product. We have a belief in ourselves. We have a belief in the opportunity in the industry. And we belong to it. We belong to the company. We belong to each other. That belonging then springboards us into becoming. It creates an environment where people want you to win. And that's what we want to promote with this simple notion of believe, belong, and become. So let me summarize believe, belong, become and what we mean there. First, believe in yourself, first and foremost. The most wasted resource in the world, as I said a moment ago, is the human resource. Discard all of the negative baggage of your past and let yourself truly believe that you can do anything that you set your heart and mind to. Second, believe in the products that we have. Gain a testimony and conviction of them. Also, believe in the opportunity and the industry and your company. Belonging to someone and something else is at the core of our needs as human beings. Come belong to this organization. Make yourself part of it. Contribute. Be attentive to the needs of others on your teams and around you. And build a sense that they belong and you belong here. Lastly, become. For many years I have shared a maxim I believe very strongly and that is this, the outcome is not just income, but the outcome is become. It's also overcome and then getting to income. Our industry, as we've said earlier, over promotes that the simple outcome is income. Our belief here is that your growth and development is at the core and central purpose of our responsibility and yours. And that when you grow, develop and become and marry that with income, you really will be a big part of the ASEA ethos. So remember, believe, belong, become. Another core principle of the ASEA ethos has to do with the unique individuals that join this organization. Each person has talents and human elements that they bring to the table that add diversity and character to our company. I like to think of the human elements that come to this company similarly to the chemical elements that we know. We have a periodic table of elements. We have 117 different chemical elements there. And we're taught that the chemical elements there are the basic chemical building blocks of matter. I like to think of the people that join this company similar to that. That if our product is made from H2O and sodium chloride, right, from water and salt, but those are coming from four elements. I think of the people that join this organization having their own human elements, whether it's insight or charisma or opportunity awareness, or it might be drive, it might be enthusiasm, it might be kindness, it might be vision. But each person that joins this organization brings a unique element to the table just like the chemical elements. And if you compared our product, which is made from these chemical elements, to a different type of product, the product being our people, then each of those unique human elements are brought to the table. 
and they make a big, big difference in who we are as a company. If the chemical elements are the basic building blocks of matter, these human elements are the basic building blocks of what matters. To me, bringing people together and making bonds, just like chemical bonds between these elements can occur, when insight and vision meet drive, and passion, and enthusiasm, because a team is built, those unique human elements make a chemical bond just like our product does. And when those chemical bonds occur, significantly bigger things happen. We know that the redox supplement we sell has those chemical bonds in it, and those bonds are important. They're active agents that are binding together to make a difference in our bodies. It's no different in our company. Each unique person that joins this organization brings their unique talents and their unique elements to the table and makes a difference. And when we connect one with another, just like these chemical bonds, very powerful groups can form and teams can form. Now, I've long felt that knowing people by three dimensions matters. One is knowing them by name. The second is knowing them by talent. And then the last dimension is knowing them by spirit. Let me explain what I mean by this. Some of you know that when I meet people, I try to memorize their names. I'm better at times than others. But over the years, I've met thousands of people in ASEA, and I've tried really hard to remember as best I can their names. Knowing someone's name matters to them. If you want to add a layer of influence in their lives, learn something about them that's unique, preferably a talent they have. And when you learn their name and a unique talent they have, a whole new dimension of their identity comes into view. The last dimension for me is knowing them by spirit. Now, what do I mean by that? That can sound or seem a little bit slippery. What I mean by knowing someone by spirit is this notion of human elements. What is their humanity that makes them unique? Maybe this emerges in a conversation about a challenge they've had, an adversity that they've overcome. It can be seen as you see them work with others and you can start to acknowledge and realize their spirits tied to their talents. This is what makes them unique in who they are. When you stop and think about it, if each person can be known by name, talent, and spirit, and from that talent and spirit understanding, we can see the human elements that they bring to the table, the basic building blocks of really what matters, we can build a very unique organization. And from my perspective, I see this table of elements, this periodic table of chemical elements. I actually have an image in my head of people, just the same as the periodic table of elements, that each face fills this table with a unique element that they bring. And that chemical uniqueness of all of us is what makes ASEA such an incredible culture. It is the diverse backgrounds of the people, their unique talents that come to bear. Lastly, I want to talk about this notion of moments. When those talents intersect with those elements, and then with moments, meaning time, where someone actually speaks out on behalf of another, using their talents and their human elements to bring ASEA to their awareness, is when the magic happens. The magic of ASEA is not in the bottle or the product or in Renew. The magic of ASEA is in a retired school teacher walking across the street and knocking on the door of a neighbor who needs help and sharing her unique talents and elements in that moment with someone she doesn't really know very well. The stories that I hear about the difference our product makes in the lives of others signal miraculous outcomes of our product. But to me, the miracle is not the product. The miracle is the nameless, faceless person that might have shared that product with someone and may not even be in the business now or be recognized for the contribution they made. That is the miracle of ASEA. It's when the talents and human elements intersect with moments where we share ourselves in this product with others. So let me summarize this notion of talents, elements, and moments and why it's part of the ASEA ethos. Remember that the power of ASEA is embodied in the collective, diverse character of our people. We believe here that everyone has gifts and talents that are unique only to them. And it's these unique human elements that are the true basic building blocks of what matters in life. When these talents and elements intersect with moments, that is time, moments that we seize on behalf of others, the miracle of ASEA is mobilized. The unique, diverse backgrounds of the people we have are an enormous part of the ASEA ethos. Bring your human elements here bring them out and share them with others. Understand and learn the people around you by name, talent, and spirit, and you'll be living the ASEA ethos. A few years ago, about a month after I had taken over as CEO of ASEA, 
uh, one of my close, close friends passed away. He was 42 years old, left a family of four children, and he and I had met each other over 25 years prior, and he had long been one of my life's greatest heroes. I flew out to his home, having been invited to speak at his funeral, and asked for a few minutes quietly in his office where he worked from home. When I walked into the office, sitting there in front of me was a children's book. I almost felt like he had left it as a message for me. And I sat in a chair in my friend's office and quietly read this children's book and immediately knew that it needed to be a part of the ASEA ethos that we shared around the world. The actual book itself was based off of a short story uh, by Leo Tolstoy. And the name of the book is The Three Questions. And I want to take you through quickly this story, this children's story. Many of you know that I have six children. I'm no stranger to kids' books. Will you let me treat you like one of my kids today and share a child story with you that actually signals some beautiful principles that are a big part of the ASEA ethos. In our story, there was a boy named Nikolai who felt uncertain about the right way to act. He said, I, I want to be a good person to his friends, but I don't always know the best way to do that. And Nikolai's friends understood and they wanted to help him. If only I could find the answers to my three questions, Nikolai continued then I would always know what to do. When is the best time to do things? Who is the most important one? And what is the right thing to do? And so Nikolai asked his friends. He asked his friend the heron, and she replied, plan in advance. He asked his friend the monkey, watch and pay close attention as a coconut's falling down to hit him on his head. And then he asked his friend the dog, who replied, you need a pack to help you know when is the best time to do things. He posed his second question, so who's the most important one? The heron said quite selfishly as she flied in the sky, those closest to heaven. The monkey, who had now been hit on the head by the coconut, was selfishly concerned with those who know how to heal the sick. And the dog, who seemed politically motivated, said those who make the rules are the most important ones. He then asked his third question, so what is the right thing to do? Again, the heron replied somewhat selfishly, flying, doing what I can do. The monkey, less concerned about things, said, have fun all the time, don't worry about things. And the politically motivated dog from a pack said, fighting is the right thing to do. Well, Nikolai was not entirely pleased with his answers, and so he hiked high up into the mountains where the old turtle lived all alone. He went to the turtle who was digging in his garden and working quite hard and said, I have three questions and I came to ask for your help. When is the best time to do things? Who, who is the most important one? And what is the right thing to do? He noticed that the turtle was tired and said, you must be tired. Let me help you. The turtle gave him his shovel and thanked him and sat down on a rock. And as they worked together, a storm arose and Nikolai heard a cry from across the bridge. He ran down the path and found a panda, a mother panda, whose leg had been injured by a fallen tree. He carried the panda carefully back to Leo the turtle's home and made a splint for her leg with a stick of bamboo. When she awoke, she said, where am I and where is my child? And Nikolai quickly realized that her baby was also in the storm. Nikolai ran back into the storm and was able to find her baby panda. The little panda was wet and scared, but alive. Nikolai carried her inside and made her warm and dry, and then laid her in her mother's arms. Leo the turtle smiled when he saw what the boy had done. But Nikolai continued with his questions until the old turtle described the answers. Yesterday, if you had not stayed to help me dig my garden, you wouldn't have heard the panda's cries for help in the storm. Therefore, the most important time was the time you spent digging the garden. The most important one at that moment was me. And the most important thing to do was to help me with my garden. Later, when you found the injured panda, the most important time was the time you spent mending her leg and saving her child. The most important ones then were the panda and her baby. And the most important thing to do was to take care of them and make them safe. And then he summarized. Remember, there's only one important time, and that time is now. The most important one is always the one you're with. 
And the most important thing is to do good for the one who is standing at your side. For these, my dear boy, are the answers to what is most important in this world. This is why we are here. You can imagine the feelings I had when I sat in my friend's office who had just passed away and pondered the implications of these three important questions. When is the best time to do things? Who is the most important one? And what is the right thing to do? If you stop and think about it, at ASEA, answering these questions the way we were taught by the turtle, which is that the most important time is now, the most important one is the one that you're with, and the most important thing to do is to do good for and by the one that's standing at your side. I immediately began to think about the good that you do at ASEA, the impact you make. I immediately began to think about the importance of time and taking advantage of right now. I immediately began to think that the greatest philosophies and ethos in the world are those that are actually focused on other people, not on ourselves. And came back and shared this at a convention a few years ago and asked for your agreement that this should be part of the ASEA ethos. So let's summarize the three questions. Just when is the best time to do things? The best and most important time is now. Who is the most important one? The most important one is always the one that you're with. And what is the right thing to do? The most important and the right thing to do is to do good for the one who is standing at your side. And so I challenge you to live the answers to these three questions. When is the best time to do things is right now. Who is the most important one? It's the one that you're with. And what is the most important thing to do? It is to do good for those that are standing by your side. One of my favorite principles uh, of the ASEA ethos is an African philosophy referred to as Ubuntu. And I first heard of this philosophy by way of an email that I received from my mother that was sharing a story that I think had been circulated pretty widely across the internet. The story tells of an anthropologist who was studying a culture in southern Africa. And uh, as kind of a test of sorts, he took a basket of fruit and set it a ways away from a group of children and lined these children up uh, looking at the fruit from a distance and told them that when he blew the whistle, they could run as quickly as they could to the fruit and those that got there first could in fact uh, eat as much as they could carry. And uh, he lined the children up and ensured that they understood and then stepped back and blew the whistle. And unexpectedly what he saw as outlined in this story is the children didn't run as you might think would be natural for them to do. They actually reached out and grabbed one another's hands and slowly walked in a straight line to the basket of fruit. Then they got around the basket, they sat in a circle and they took one piece of fruit out and took a bite and each child around the circle took a bite. And they continued to do that until all of them were filled. And as the story read, the anthropologist was very surprised by this act, wondered if maybe they didn't understand that if they had run ahead of the group, they actually could have had more. And he asked one of the children, how is it possible that you all knew to do this and actually behaved this way? And one of the children said, how can we be happy if one of us is sad? And then he said the word Ubuntu. After reading that story, uh, again, I'm constantly thinking about the ASEA ethos and, and where core principles that we can teach can make a difference in helping us to build a unique culture and ethos here. And I started to research this notion of Ubuntu. And I learned that the African word Ubuntu and the philosophy actually stretches across several different countries and actual uh, cultures there. But it's most effectively translated into English in a very simple phrase that says, I am because we are. And I found myself pondering that. That's a very powerful phrase. Ubuntu means I am because we are. It doesn't mean that I am because I am, which might have been the notion or the philosophy that would have compelled a young child to run faster ahead of everyone else, focused on the I am. But it actually signals that as people, we recognize that not one of us is independent of another, that we depend on each other, and we're committed to one another. And that's the power of this notion of I am because we are, or Ubuntu. I actually spent a fair amount of time researching this, and I found some beautiful quotes uh, by 
African uh, leaders and philosophers that understood this. One of my favorites is from Re Reverend Desmond Tutu. Speaking on Ubuntu, he said, Ubuntu speaks of the very essence of being human. We say, hey, so-and-so has Ubuntu. Well, then you are generous, you are hospitable, you are friendly and caring and compassionate. You share what you have. It's to say, my humanity is caught up and is inextricably bound up in yours. We belong in a bundle of life. We say a person is a person through other persons, which is another definition of Ubuntu. Desmond Tutu goes on to say the following, that a person with Ubuntu is open and available to others, affirming of others, and does not feel threatened that others are able and good. For he or she has a proper self-assurance that comes from knowing that he or she belongs in a greater whole and is only diminished when others are humiliated or when others are diminished, when others are tortured or oppressed or treated as if they were less than who they are. These are beautiful and rich statements about a wonderful philosophy that prevails across many different cultures. I began to ask myself, this is ASEA. No person at ASEA gets recognized in the absence of the help of others. No person advances in rank without others. In a very real way, at ASEA, any one of you could say, I am only because we are. I'm here because others told me about ASEA. I'm here at Bronze Base Camp because my team members told others about ASEA. I love the notion of thinking that we don't exist as islands independent one from another. We're all interconnected. Our choices, which we sometimes might argue are independent of anyone else, actually have an effect on the whole. And this to me is a beautiful principle, even a truth that should prevail here at ASEA. We should all maintain the attitude of humility that I am not because I am, but I am because we are. If we maintain that philosophical disposition here at the home office, we'll make decisions with you in mind. We'll recognize that we aren't an island to ourselves, but we have a responsibility to you. It's similarly, in the field, if you take that attitude upon yourself, you'll ask yourself at any given moment if what you're doing can affect the whole positively or in some cases negatively. And use that filter of Ubuntu to remind you that I am because we are. That self-same year that I read this story, I shared this philosophical message at convention. And what emerged from that is this notion that I am ASEA, we are ASEA. All of us are part of this great movement at ASEA. And I want to challenge you to remember that if the heart and lungs got into a battle with one another, who would suggest or win that they're more important than the other? I think we all know that they both depend entirely upon each other for an organism or, frankly, an organization to survive. You in the field are the heart of this company, and we may represent the lungs, but we're both absolutely vital organs in this organization. And if we can maintain this beautiful philosophy of Ubuntu as a core principle of the ASEA ethos, I think we'll all understand that none of us exist in the absence of the others, that I am because we are and you are too. So in summary, remember where Ubuntu fits in the ASEA ethos. I am because we are. No one exists in isolation. We're all interconnected. What we do affects the whole, and not just the whole of ASEA, but the whole world. And none of us reaches any heights without the support and help of others. Let's remember Ubuntu. Earlier this year, uh, as we were celebrating the five-year anniversary of ASEA, I wanted to summarize the ASEA ethos in connection with our convention. But I had a strong impression to add one more dimension to the ethos, to round it out. I shared that new dimension of the ASEA ethos at our convention this year. I began the presentation of that by asking a simple question. And the question was, what if you had a product that could do the following things? What if you had a product that could strengthen the immune system or boost feelings of optimism and joy or even pleasure and enthusiasm? What if you had a product that could reduce anxiety or even depression or make you more resilient? 
that could strengthen relationships and even inspire a greater connection to your community? What if you had a product that could improve the length and quality of your sleep or reduce symptoms of illness? What if you had a product that could lower blood pressure or make you less affected by aches and pains? Or even a product that could promote forgiveness and increase life happiness and satisfaction? I think you'd all agree. If I brought you a product that scientifically was proven to do all of the things I just listed, not only would you want it, but you'd probably want to share it with other people, similar to ASEA. Well, much as I'd like to tell you that product is ASEA, it's not. It's actually the simple notion and principle of gratitude. Now, you may say, well, how do you know that gratitude can do all these things? Um, a professor at UC Davis in California by the name of Robert Emmons has made the last 10 plus years of his career and focus as a PhD in the studying of the effects of gratitude. And he defines gratitude as an affirmation of goodness. First and foremost, that we affirm that there are good things in the world. There are gifts or benefits that we've received. But that secondly, we figure out where those good things or that goodness comes from. And we come to a realization that the source of this goodness is not always ourselves, but actually often outside of ourselves. And in the case of the fact that some of this comes from other people, we acknowledge that other people, or even if you're spiritually minded, even higher powers, uh, give us many gifts, big and small, that help us achieve the good things in our lives. Now you may ask, well, how did he prove it then? You know, how did he know scientifically, for example, this would lower blood pressure? Well, he did one simple test. He gave a group of people a journal, a gratitude journal, and invited those people every day to write down five things for which they were grateful. Could be a sunset, or a really good cup of coffee that day, or a chance to go for a walk with their loved one, or visit a grandmother, or something in nature. Didn't matter what it was, his feeling was you can list anything you want, but list five things every day. Contrastingly, what he did was asked a group of people to write down five things every day that bothered them, that annoyed them. Things not, not necessarily gratitude, but things that frustrated them. And then he measured things like blood pressure, quality of sleep, what their aptitude was to forgive others, or how involved they were in their communities. And using simple measurements, he could prove that those people that were taking a few minutes every day to list out what they were most grateful for were in fact happier, more resilient, less affected by aches and pains. They had stronger relationships and connections in their community. It occurred to me that we at ASEA should be a grateful people. We should be expressing gratitude to each other. Again, if you're spiritually minded to a higher power, I'm indifferent to the person or object for whom or to whom you're expressing gratitude. That's up to you. But as a people and as a culture, we should find ourselves expressing gratitude often. Doing so lifts other people. He didn't talk about the effects of gratitude on the people to whom you're giving it. He actually talked about the ones that were expressing the gratitude. It's been my experience that when someone expresses gratitude to me and acknowledges and recognizes my contribution to their life, I also feel better inside. In this regard, I would argue that it's not only lifting the person expressing it, but those that are receiving it as well. And so, as we round out the ASEA ethos, it feels important to me that we take some time every day, and part of these cultural beliefs, behaviors, and characteristics that are fundamentally unique to us, we should be thankful. We should carry a gratitude journal, or even download a gratitude app. You can find an application in the App Store and list out your five things every day on your phone. So in summary, how does gratitude fit into the ASEA ethos? Be grateful for every moment. Remember, life is a gift. Gratitude expressed to others makes us healthy, happy, and represents the highest form of generosity. Write down five things that you're grateful for every day. I believe if we do that, not only will we be happier and healthier, as Dr. Emmons clearly is proving through his studies, I think our culture will continue to be different to others will be a place where we believe, we belong, we become, we manage motives, we keep E under P, we treat each other kindly as people, as we learn in the anatomy of peace, and we're grateful. 
I believe that will be the capstone to the ASEA ethos. And so I challenge you, remember, be grateful. Write down the five things today and every day for which you're grateful. And do it at ASEA as well, and we'll build a beautiful ethos together. If a corporation truly is a body, then I submit it can have a soul. The soul of a corporation is the spirit that gives life to the entire organization. And that spirit needs to be embodied in a set of beliefs and values that we can all agree upon and try to live. This summary of the ASEA ethos is an attempt to signal to you the beliefs, behaviors, and characteristics we want to cascade from one generation to another. What does this really mean to you? Well, first of all, it means we'd ask you to give serious consideration and reflection on these principles. Are you managing your motives? Are you keeping your motivation and commitment to ego, economics, and money beneath that of your commitment that's unwavering to principles? Are you building your capacity and developing yourself, becoming more? Are you recognizing that challenging yourself to reach new heights and developing your skills will keep you in the flow channel of focus and happiness. How are you treating others? Are you treating them as people or as objects? Do you see and respond to their humanity? And what about believe, belong, become? Do you believe in yourself? Do you have a deep conviction of the products you offer and the opportunity this represents for others? Do you see yourself as a part of a bigger belonging? Are you lifting others around you? and hoping for the same back to you. And then are you growing and becoming, remembering that the outcome is not just income, but the outcome is overcome, become, and then income. Do you recognize that you have unique talents and human elements, that when you bring them and let them come to life here to see it, you're helping us to build a beautiful culture where each individual person is valued and recognized as diverse, capable, and contributing to what we're trying to build here. Do you recognize that when you in fact live those talents and let them come out, that your human elements, when they intersect with time on behalf of others, mobilize the miracle of ASEA? And what of the three questions? When is the best time to do things? Who is the most important one? And what is the right thing to do? Can we remember that the best time is now and the most important one is the one that you're with and that the right thing to do is to do good by the people that stand at your side. And then Ubuntu. I am because we are. Remembering that none of us is an island. We all depend on each other. Every choice we make, every decision has an effect on the world around us and the people here at ASEA. And then lastly, gratitude. Remembering that just the simple act of affirming that there is in fact goodness in the world and that not all of that goodness comes from me but in fact from the people around us and even higher powers, if that's what you believe, then express that gratitude, write it down, capture it, and see the unique benefits that we now are learning scientifically can make such a big difference in your lives. These principles combine together to make and embody what we refer to as the ASEA ethos. That distinguishing set of beliefs and values that are differentiating to us. Now, can we add to this? Of course we can. But this is where it stands today. And what does this mean for you? What we would ask you to do is become familiar with these principles and truths. Ask yourself these questions. Where do they fit in my life? Are you cascading these from one generation to another by sharing them and by living them? Talking about cultural principles is very different than actually living them. I want to make sure I offer a caution. No one is perfect. Even a corporation like ours that sets out to live these values will make mistakes on a daily basis. But if we'll all intend and strive earnestly to do these things, I believe we can build the most unique culture of any corporation in the world. I promise you that if you'll try to live these principles, not only in your ASEA business, but in every dimension of your life, you'll be happier, you'll have more success, and you'll have greater influence for good on those around you. And isn't that what we're all about here at ASEA? making a difference in the world, having an impact for good on others by way of our product, but also by way of our unique culture, the ASEA ethos.